When we talk about classical music, what kind of things does it bring to your mind? You might start thinking about maybe guys in wigs playing along to a string quartet or something, and to be honest, you wouldn't be far wrong. But that's if we're talking about the classical era of music. So there are two different meanings when we talk about classical music. Number one. The classical era. So we've got classical with a capital C. And this is referring to the sort of time when Mozart was alive around like the 1700s. And we have classical music number two. Two. Broader sense of classical music with a small c. Which covers sort of all music from about 1100 to the present day. But... Most importantly, it doesn't refer to things like pop, rock, jazz, and folk, and that kind of stuff. So the more popular styles. We just use this term classical music really to sort of tell them apart. So, what is the classical era of music? In the 1700s, people started looking back at the beauty and the order of the ancient Greeks in their poetry and their drama. And, you know, composers thought, hmm, I want to get a part of this. So they started incorporating some of those ideas into their music. Emphasis was being placed back into the strength of a good melody. The thing is, good tunes have never been out of fashion, you know. Even in the Baroque period, there's some great tunes, but the music was a lot more dense, it's a lot more complicated. Composers like Bach that we've met before. I will stop these, I promise. Maybe. Anyway, composers like Bach were making very technical, complicated music. And the reason it sounds so busy is he was using a writing style called polyphony. All polyphony means is loads of different melodies are all sort of weaving together to make a whole sound. So when we hear one of his pieces being played right next to a piece of Mozart, for example, you can really hear the difference. He's using a slightly different way of writing called homophony. This is where the focus is on one sort of melody line being played over like chords, either in a piano or in other instruments. Thing is, it would be a bit too simple to say that homophony was the only difference that classical music had to the previous time. Music was actually pretty quickly evolving, and a lot of it was coming out of one place. Vienna. Late 18th century Vienna was a hotbed of new ideas where composers like Gluck and Mozart were mastering a new form of music called comic opera. Other new forms of music were also coming from left, right and centre, so we had the symphony being born, we had sonatas being played, and we had the formation of what we now sort of know as the regular symphony orchestra. So the orchestra started getting standardised with the string section being the old violin, viola, cello, bass combo. Some of the old ones sort of went out of fashion a bit, like the random baroque strings like the viola de more, if you've ever heard of that. Viola of love? We've all seen string quartets either at weddings or going down on the Titanic. This was born at the same time as well in the classical period. Brand new instruments were being invented and put into the orchestra, so we had like the flutes, the horns, the clarinets. Oh yeah, and we had the invention of the piano, as you do. It sounds weird, but actually a lot of the classical music can be quite funny. So one of the big dogs in classical music was Joseph Haydn. Yeah. He was such a big name when it came to his influence on the music world that people started calling him Papa Haydn. It's kind of like that trend now on Twitter where people start calling celebrities they like dad and mom. Anyway, Haydn was a bit of a joker. He had a symphony called The Surprise and this was kind of like the original jump scare. So you know like in a movie when you're just watching it and then all of a sudden like a zombie sort of jumps at you. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Well, actually not so much with the zombies. Haydn's audience at the time were all pretty rich and a lot of them would go and have a big meal beforehand where they get pretty drunk and just sit and a lot of them would actually sleep through the symphony. So we thought, do you know what? I'm gonna scare these guys. I'm gonna really make them jump. So, this is what he did. In the second movement of the symphony we have this famous violin tune playing. Lovely. And then all of a sudden, 16 bars in. They get woken up by this loud crash in the orchestra. And, you know, everyone loved it. It was great and it's still being played today. Composers started getting a bit more adventurous. Just like in that Haydn piece we were just talking about, he was playing about with dynamics, which is basically volume, and that's a pretty extreme example of it. A very recognisable element of writing in the classical period was something called the Alberti bass. So that's Alberti bass, not dirty bass, which is something a bit different. <laughs> Now Mozart used this style of writing quite frequently in his pieces, and it sounds a little bit like this. It's quite pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty nice, but it's nothing too special. But just listen to this. So this is the bass line, and now place the melody above it. Now we're talking. Yes, Mozart. Just like the ancient Greeks, classical composers were obsessed with the idea of balance. So classical pieces can actually be quite distinctive by how symmetrical the melodies are. So, listen to this. This music's from a sonata by Haydn, and the first phrase goes like this. You can hear that it doesn't quite sound finished, does it? You sort of want it to resolve somehow. So here's the next phrase. So 
So it sort of sounded like the first one's asking a question, and then the second one answers it. Haydn also experimented with using folk music in his pieces. He was taking music that was normally associated with the common people, like folk dances, and even like yodeling and stuff like that, and he put them into his own music. Now, this was important because his music was being played in the courts, for the aristocrats, he was being paid by kings and people like that to make music. And by putting the music of like the normal people, that was kind of subversive. So by using these folk tunes in his orchestral music, Haydn actually sort of paved the way for the 19th and 20th century composers who started devoting their entire lives to writing music to represent their homelands. So you start getting composers like Mussorgsky, who you couldn't listen to without thinking of Russia, or Chopin, who you couldn't listen to without thinking of Poland. Another important thing about the classical symphony is that it started representing real life things like thunder and birdsong. So these ideas kind of exploded in the romantic time when it was all about the drama of life being represented in music. Talking of drama, there's one man that we haven't talked about yet today. Ludwig van Beethoven. And guess where he was writing? Yep, Vienna. So Beethoven's early stuff was definitely pretty groundbreaking, pushing the boundaries that even Haydn and Mozart haven't really reached. So the premiere of his fifth symphony led one critic to say music was the most romantic of all the arts. So the transition had begun and Beethoven was leading the way into the new romantic era. So as you can tell the classical era in music was a little bit more than just guys in wigs and weird costumes. It was a time for experiments and inventions and a lot of the most famous tunes that we know today are actually from that time and it led on to the explosion of writing in the romantic period and in the 19th century. So this was just a very short introduction to classical music and if you've liked any of the music you've heard today I'm going to put some links down below for places you can go and check it out. If you've liked this video then please give it a thumbs up and if you want to subscribe then you can follow the journey that we're going to go on. So see you in the next episode of Talk The Music.